Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast, supported as ever by The Athletic, the best place to read about football online. Visit www.theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO and you will get a 30-day free trial and 50% off your annual subscription if you sign up for one. 8p a day, it's very, very good. Uh, please go and do that. Today's episode, we have Alex. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. Good. Um, and we were also delighted earlier to be joined by Mr. Steve Modison, famed, of course, for his playing football career at clubs such as Millwall, Norwich, Leeds, currently Shrewsbury, other clubs also included. And because I don't mention them, it doesn't mean they're not great clubs. Bishop Stortford. Bishop Stortford. Stevenage Town. I really wanted to say to Steve, I didn't, but that my uncle lives in Bishop Stortford and he's a Norwich fan. So... He's, he's got double love for Steve. Okay. There you go. That's good. Um, but we talked to Steve today. It's very kind of him to come in and speak to us. We talked to him. Uh, he's doing his coaching badges. We talked about tactics and the differences between what we see watching a game and what he knows playing a game. Those sort of little um, conflicts maybe between, you know, one of the best examples he gave was of uh, being shouted at to, to close someone down. But he's been told by his coach not to. Yeah, like that's that's great. So we talk a lot about stuff like that. We also talk about sports psychology, which is one of Steve's interests too, and something that I think it's fair to say seems to have changed changed his life, but certainly as it relates to his mm. career. Um, so we talk quite a lot about that. What else did we talk about, Alex? We talked about social media. Yeah, we talked <laughs> about the pressures on footballers nowadays, yeah. um, how the dressing room can or sometimes doesn't help players navigate difficult circumstances. Yeah. Just loads and loads of insight into it was basically really being a footballer. it was yeah. really interesting yeah and it was great to have Steve down here because he says you know and we said to him afterwards actually that a lot of the conversation it's unusual for um, to hear it as it relates to football because either the players are still playing and the clubs tell them not to or they've no interest in talking about these things publicly um, it was a little bit unusual and it was very I thought it was special yeah I did um, so thank you to Steve and without further ado. Here is the episode. I hope you enjoy it, um, and uh, we'll see you again next time. It's Steve Morrison. <laughs> Hello, Steve. Afternoon. How's it going? Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks so much for coming in to talk to us. Really appreciate it. No problem. Um, you're here today because we want to talk about a few things that are of interest to you and of interest to us. Uh, what we do here at TFO, as people who listen will know, is we like to focus on things like uh, the tactics, geopolitics a little bit as well, but also the way that the game actually works. And it is rare for us to get an opportunity to speak to someone who is a footballer and understands these things from the inside. So what we are hoping to get an understanding of today, Alex and I, is whether what we talk about and what we see is rubbish or, <laughs> or not. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, I suppose the first thing to talk about um, might be tactics because it's a big love of ours here, as people who listen will know. Um, and Alex spends hours of his week watching footage and uh, occasionally going to games and trying to understand what's happening on the pitch. And one of our big questions is whether or not what we are seeing is how that relates to what you as a footballer have been told. And Alex, do you want to summarise that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, we we you know we'll analyze a game and I'll I'll watch a, a team and and I think you can see sort of patterns and and general things emerging. I always I'm always reticent to say, therefore, that we can understand what a manager is trying to achieve because I think we don't know that. You know, I'm not in the dressing room. I'm not getting the instructions. And you you might see you know, obviously Klopp's trying to press or perhaps trying to keep possession and move players around the pitch. But to what degree do you get, I don't know, like a, a complex tactical briefing before a game? How much of what actually happens on the pitch is as a result of what's been rehearsed and what's intended and how much is just a response to circumstances as they evolve during a game? And, and a good place to start as well might be who is the coach that you've had that you've found to be the most sort of tactically initiated well, everything you said is is correct in terms of every game that you go into, a hell of a lot of work goes into um, what we're actually going to do. So very, 
very rarely have I come across it where this old phrase of, I'll just go out and play. That is nonsense. You, you can't just go out and play. You'll get, you'll get beat because uh, the other team will have done tactics and they would have uh, worked on what they're going to do against you. And that's exactly what happens. It's, it's like a game of chess. Each, each week, uh, you're preparing for a, a new game, uh, a new game of chess, in a fact, in a sense, and um, you you have people behind the scenes who analyse the opposition, find strengths, weaknesses, um, tactical flaws, um, the ta- uh, what their we try and predict what their tactics are going to be for the next game, and then we spend all week or a couple of days if it's a Saturday Tuesday game working out how we're going to beat the other teams and tactics and there's people behind the scenes that that do all that work and then you have the managers and you have the coaches who sit down and they put a plan together and they pick teams to to beat the other team so you might have won a game at a weekend but that team that manager doesn't feel is going to go out and win that game the next weekend I think you see that a lot with like uh with Klopp especially, he will pick a team, go and dismantle someone three or four nil and then play another game a week later and then a couple of players are left out and you always think like, why has he left them out? And it's like, well, and I think he often says in his after-match interviews that he feels that that was the better team to play that game, might mean a more defensive player or a more attacking player. So loads goes into it and everything that we do on a football pitch this is one of the biggest um, things that I think football fans don't understand. We don't go out there and do what we want to do. We go and do what we're asked to do as a player. So if, if, if for example, we play someone and the manager said, oh, I don't want you to press the centre-halves. When the fans are then standing on the side and screaming for you to go and press the centre-halves, it's not because I don't want to go and press the centre-half, it's because yeah. that's not what... It's not what we've planned. Do you we've... there close him down all the time? <laughs> oh, all the time. And you're like, you're like, run. And you're like, no, 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 no. The game plan that you don't know about yeah. is we're going to stay in a mid block, for example. We're going to let the centre half have the ball because they can't, we don't feel they can hurt us from that position. But the two deep liars might really hurt us on the ball because they're really good. So yeah. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to stop them having the ball, let the centre half have the ball and say, what are you two going to do with it? Is it hard for you as a player then if your coach either gets it wrong completely or it just doesn't work for whatever reason and the job that you've been asked specifically to do is the bit that's gone wrong? Is it hard if the fans criticise you or the pundits afterwards or whatever criticise you because of some, you've done your job as you were asked to do it but the coach has got that wrong? Um, no, it's not hard. It's not hard to... It, it, might, it may be for some people. I can only talk about myself. Mm. Um, from... Uh, from from my point of view, as long as I've carried out my instructions to the best of my ability, I can I can sleep at night. Do you know what I mean? Like if I've gone out there and and asked, been asked to do something, and I've gone completely the other way and done my own thing, mm. then then that's 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 wrong because that's not what it's not what I've been asked to do. Have you ever done that and it's worked though? Um, just just gone rogue. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. Re- you can't really go rogue because like ultimately it's a team. And for example, if I then run off and start pressing someone and I look behind and no one else is doing it, it's, it's pointless. And someone might go, oh, do you know what? He really worked hard. No, you didn't. You just wasted energy. Yeah. You wasted your, your time to appease maybe people who are watching the game, if you know what I mean. But it, it's, it's, it's very, it's very um, specific what you do because we have so much, like what you're saying, like what you do, when you look into the games, like it's so specific. You can tell me, I'd say, like, what's this person's strengths? Well, I'll tell you what, he's really bad on the ball. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to let him have the ball all the game. Do you know what I mean? So it's quite, it's very in-depth. It's very, um, it's very uh, um, thought out. And uh, the best managers I've worked with have been those ones that there is, you can't be, you can't be in the middle. There's got to be a clear, right. 
clear aim to where you're going there's got to be a clear structure to what you're doing so more preparation rather than less with the best 100% yeah. 100% and and in in terms of i mean obviously it's, it can be very specific and i'm i'm guessing that you would get a briefing on i mean not necessarily your opposite man but you as a striker would be playing largely against center backs so you would know if they're good on the ball if they're good in the air whether they're very strong on one foot but rubbish on the other and how difficult is it when you're when you're playing a sport that requires a great degree of physical fitness to also keep all of that in your mind and to have that changing week to week because I, I think sometimes people people feel that that you know football is obviously there's a level of innate talent yeah you're either good at football or you're not yeah. but the degree to which your ability to retain complicated information and instructions and find it and process it during the course of 90 minutes of also running around and getting kicked and doing all of these different things and adapting to stuff being shouted off the sidelines yeah. and and being mentally exhausted as and well being as mentally physically. exhausted as well as physically and, and when you you know when you're physically exhausted the first thing to go is kind of your concentration yeah. and yeah. your ability yeah. to focus so you know that that seems to me that it requires a lot of footballers in a way that most people actually wouldn't really consider being a requirement. Yeah, uh, and and ultimately that's why the best of the best, the best, the ones at the top of the game can do it all. And they've, they've got it all. And I think that's why when you start going down the leagues, don't there, there will be people in... My team now, Shrewsbury, there'll be people in League One, uh, League, League Two, even the conference, I'd say, they have got that one game in them where uh, if they did that every week, they wouldn't be playing at that level. They'll be playing at a much higher level. There'll be people down there who are faster than people in the Premier League, who are stronger than people in the Premier League. But as you said, it's about putting it all together as, and that's why... They said you, you look at people like I think the guy's amazing. Like you take Ronaldo for example, he's he's got all of those facets to his game at just a ridiculously high level. But he will be tactically smart. You saw that when they were in the Euro finals, yeah. and all of a sudden he's on the touchline barking orders mm -hmm. because he can see problems and that's the kind of stuff that happens on the pitch and as you see your fitness your fitness your ability on the ball you've like you've honed that and you've harnessed that for years we can all run for me obviously the mental side of it is if you want to run I mean you don't have to run you can no one's forcing you to do it you do it because um, you want to do it ultimately um, and I think as a football player to be able to control all of that all of that stuff that's going on that's why we invest so much time in it like it's your life it has to be football the best players football is football's life and the other side of it fits in around football do you know what I mean it has yeah. to be it can't be the other way around you can't you can't have this thing going on elsewhere and then just go oh drop it and I'll go training for an hour. You have to, you have to, there's so much info. Like you, you can, it's, it's everywhere now, isn't it? You can find out about players, all of their attributes, all their traits. You've got like different scouting platforms that you can see. And, and I said, all of those stuff, I can, I can play a game on Saturday and I can literally get the information off of our analyst team and it'll be clips of every single player in the other team. Um, I can specifically say, I want to know what who the two centre halves are going to play on Saturday, against on Saturday. I can look at that. Like me as a player, I've always, I've always worked my game around. Let me weigh up their strengths and weaknesses, and I'll weigh up my strengths and weaknesses, and I'll look at the other centre halves and I'll go right. Where can I get at them at? So if there's someone who's as quick as me, strong as me, big as me. Um, I'll stay away from him. I'll go and play on the other one who's maybe maybe stronger than me, 
maybe quicker than me, but not really as big as me. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I'll like, there's there's my weakness. Like I, I can I can get at him now, and I'll use that to get at him. And that's where it said everything just becomes so technical and mm. tactical nowadays. Um, how how much has that changed since you started out? Oh, it's full circle. Full circle to when I first started. I said, do you remember pre-seasons were just finding parks and you run round them. This is professional clubs at Northampton as a, when I first uh, got my YTS, as it was back then. Um, and I said it was run around and how did you judge fitness? Well, it was until someone was sick and then you stopped doing it. <laughs> it didn't matter who it was. Once someone was sick, you stopped doing it. And, and then... I would never have made it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it just said even games. Like, I don't even remember talking about f- formations back then. I just remember it being just I suppose four four two every week every so what was your job what were you told to do like ahead of a game at the beginning of your career go out and score a goal yeah I don't ever remember being told yeah. specifically get, get in amongst it yeah. yeah wow and when did you notice that start to change and because you've when, been up and down the leagues as well so presumably there will be a difference I, I yeah suppose. so I went I went down to from Northampton got released for the second time um to Bishop Stortford, so that was Conference South. So again, that was just I, I went into Bishop Stortford and I just did really, really well. I was fitter than everyone else. I was quicker than everyone else. I just come out of professional football into semi-pro football, so there was that. It was an imbalance. Do you know what I mean? I was just like sharper than everyone else and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I went into Stevenage and I had three years there. And yeah, even then it was just it was more of a. Do you know what? The manager put like a big team together uh, with big players. We were just going to be physically stronger than everyone else. Um, I just scored loads of goals. But I was saying to, I was talking to a manager uh, yesterday on the phone on the way to my game, and uh, uh, you get seven, eight chances a game at conference level, mm. and you score a couple. Do you know what I mean? You go into it, it's like law of averages. You just, the more chances you get the more you're going to score. So, and then as you start going up the level, everything becomes a little bit less and you have to come, you either sink or swim, don't you? You either get a bit more clinical or, or, you, or you... You hear that a lot. We, we commentators say that a lot of pundits when uh, new teams are promoted up to the Premier League. You often hear them saying, you know, you won't get that type of chance yeah. more than once a game. And that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. It's an interesting perspective to take. The game is the same, but those number of opportunities are, are minimised the higher up you go. Yeah, 100%. The other thing that you often hear when you're watching commentary on the, the disparity between, say, domestic level and international level is the amount of time that you have to think about stuff is suddenly diminished yeah. because mm. everyone's really, really good. Yeah. And so that those opportunities are less frequent, but you also have less actual time in which to process mm-hmm. how to make the most of that chance is that do you think that's to do with a combination you know the the, the physical level is probably yeah. fairly high but there's I, I suspect that all well pretty much all Premier League players are of the same fitness level they're all super fit you know it's it's just how it is so yeah. is it that mental tactical side that is what reduces the time um I think when you get to that level there's obviously going to be people who are slightly fitter than others like he's like James Milner for example who like wins Liverpool's fitness pre-season every year do you know what I mean there's always, always he will do for like, the next 20 years as well yeah. I think James Milner right um, but when you get to like the Premier League and international level everyone's as quick and as strong and as fast and then you get like the exceptions again do you know what I mean like uh, Raheem Sterling it's just it's gone on to another level, hasn't it? It's gone to mess it, and all of a sudden, he just looks like he's faster than everyone else, he's sharper than everyone else. But then, I, I presume, um, the Sterling one's been he's got Pep Guardiola and the tactical kind of player he is. He's obviously put more into his game, so makes him has made him be maybe not a he's not a not a, a better player from a physical point of view. But from a mental but point he's a of view, smarter a, a player. smarter player, yeah. it's tactical. He now knows that if he sets the ball off and spins, he's going to get the ball back, and no one's going to be sharper than him over that five ten yards. And he just looks 
and those number of opportunities increase throughout a game maybe because yeah. of the type of team well, said, you, ta- well. you take a um you take a man city and you might be going get their stats and you see how many shots on target they're having in a game mm. and what is it i think it was it spurs with it 30 odd chances or something like yeah, that. yeah 30 and then spurs had three i think three yeah yeah so then you go down to uh not a norwich or maybe like one of the bo- one of the lower teams in in the Premier League, I don't know, like a West Ham, something like that. They'll, n- n- no doubt, they'll get no more than five to ten. And I wonder how many of them are actually clear cut. Yeah. Like Man City's chances are clear cut, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? Like, I wonder how many chances they get a game. And that was what, one of the things I noticed when you went up there, all of a sudden, yeah, you might get one chance a game, but you've got to kind of take that, yeah. that chance. And as I said, going back to the, the tactical one, once you start going into league football, it starts becoming a lot more, a lot more tactical. But it gets more tactical. Like I've never seen tactical side of the game like it was when I, under Gary Speed at Wales and Chris Cole. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. That what, was, what was that? How do you categorize the difference? Like, how, why does it become more tactical? And how and how is that like applied to you when you're training with the with the? So team? I've I've I'd gone from I'd gone from conference to League One to Premier League in two years. Yeah, so I went, I did three years in the conference, joined League One, got promoted, went to the championship, had one season in the championship, got bought by Norwich in the Premier League, right? So I'd got, it was just, people have often asked me, what was it like? I don't even remember. It was just a whirlwind, you know what I mean? It was just, I was just doing it. I yeah. haven't, it's only now when you start looking back and you're processing it all and you go, what, what happened? I remember there was, there was key moments mm. that made me, go to that next level and made me get better and obviously better players and all that kind of stuff and then going to Norwich and and then all of a sudden getting my call up and for Wales and going there it was John Toshek, Dean Saunders, Roy Evans were the management staff and it was very much like old school and then Gary Speed comes in and I'm, I'm training with Gareth Bale, um, Craig Bellamy who is... Craig Bellamy is uh, Craig Bellamy the myth in my eyes because that geezer is the most professional man, mm. and he made me so much better. Right. Just yeah, don't get me wrong. His his words hurt and his words are harsh at the time, but when you look back on it and you go, well, I never did it again. I was better mm. for that, um, and but everything was just you couldn't even like you'd start the day get up at a Welsh, a Welsh camp, go and um, go and have a toilet with your little um, pot, see how hydrated you were. And then you'd have to go to the, the guys and you'd see them and you'd give them the pot and then they'd take a, a prick of your finger to check your blood levels. And then like you'd every go morning. off, have breakfast. Oh, every morning. And then you'd, wow. you'd, 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 you'd then go to training and you'd, you'd think, oh, I feel great. You go and train and all of a sudden you get like whipped out after like half hour of the session. Yeah. I'd be like, why, why, why am I not training anymore? Well, your blood wasn't, you wasn't at 100% recovery yet. You'd only at like 80%, so you can only do 80% of the session. And then, and then all of a sudden, but it was just like, it just evolved. And then like, we worked every day on like certain patterns and the tactical side of the game, um, how we was going like to pass it out to the right back and then, we was going to get the centre half to step past their striker line and get on the ball, which so some people use looking at going, oh, if you get this wrong, the striker's in on goal. Yeah. We worked on it enough that you don't get it wrong in the end. You just have an option that if it's not on to do something else. I've never felt so good playing football in, in my whole life. This podcast is supported by The Athletic. I say this every week because it's true and great. Theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO, 30-day free trial, 50% off a annual subscription. And it really is worthwhile, Alex, isn't it? Tell me why you think it's worthwhile today. Uh, I found an article which uh, I found really entertaining as a kind of behind-the-scenes look at something. So obviously the Mm. situation at Bolton Wanderers has been anything but entertaining. No, I wish I hadn't um, just made that face for people who are watching because that's not the face you make when you talk about Bolton Wanderers. No, you make not this so face. much. But but they've 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 been saved and they're still there obviously the points deduction for going into administration, but um 
This piece is called 36 Hours, A 14-Year-Old Work Experience Boy and Litres of Coffee, colon, How Bolton Signed Nine Players on Deadline Day. I tell you what, litres of coffee would affect your colon. Because of, you yeah. know, okay. um, bowel movements. So this is basically, uh, Greg O'Keefe's done a kind of behind-the-scenes look at what happened, how they got people through the door, the, the kind of frantic... Uh, rebuilding that obviously had to happen against a backdrop of, of financial meltdown. So, at any point when you were reading it, did you feel like oh, I've wasted eight p today? Uh, no, no, I did not feel that. What did you feel? The inverse of that? Explain I, I, how you were feeling about I it. I felt like the value that I received for my eight p was significant. Did you do that thing where you, you you find a bargain in a shop and then when you've bought it, you've been to the teller, you've been to the checkout, you've paid for it, you're about to leave, and you think, turn around. Can this be real? Did they make a mistake? Did they make a mistake? Are Rolos only 20p? They're not. No. But The Athletic is 8p a day. I know. That's like the cost of a chocolate bar in 1924. Yeah. I mean, probably less less than that, actually. Yeah. I, even I'm not that old. They had a different currency back then. We should have gone after the 60s. Anyway, www.theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO. 30-day free trial. Uh, uh, 50% off your annual subscription. Uh, I know we're joking about it, but Christ, it makes our life easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Anyway, there you go. Back to Steve Morrison now. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Goodbye. So are you are you sort of sat in a room with a big old presentation on a screen or are you getting like a little document, you know, take this off after training and have a read through it and you get your individual breakdown? Or they're just telling you on the pitch. Or are they the just pitch. telling you on the pitch? Yeah, How, the how's the information coming? It's just, you don't, you just do it. Yeah. You're told to do it. Um, yeah, you ask questions. Why am I doing this? What what what's the benefit? What's what's the not? It's the first time I'd I'd come across like two day recovery and all that kind of all that kind of stuff. And the idea is that you do it so many times that it just becomes like muscle memory. It just becomes part of your right. part of your life. Like, obviously, you go back to club. This is where the I was club. Ask and, you you, you yeah. go back to club, and it's it's different to that. Mm. That you don't. Well, also because you don't spend much time with the national team, right? And one of the things we talk about, particularly in the lead up to World Cups or Euros, is if, if your national side is asking you to do something which is particularly different from your club side, which is why I think having lots of Tottenham players in the England team has helped over the last helped the England team over the last few years because they're doing something broadly similar. But when you go and you work with Gary Speed at Wales and it's complicated and there's a lot to remember, and then you go back to your club, how easy is it to remember what you're supposed to be doing when you're back again with the national team the next time? Yeah, you're it training? become it becomes second nature. And so yeah. we're not. It's, it's all there for you. It's not something you have to go. You literally wake up in the morning, like you kind of imagine. It's a bit different, I suppose, with like the England setup with yeah. Wales. So it'd be, let's say, we're standing in a hotel, but your dad booked the floor of a hotel. Do you know what I mean? So you'd come out your room at the end of the corridor was the medical room where, you, like, it is with most clubs. But obviously, it was kind of they had like book a whole floor, so everything's there. It's just that like, it was like it was a process, mm. and that's what football was all about and we're all about as footballers like we're so none of us like change so like routine it's just routine you get up in the morning there's always someone who doesn't do it mm. and they have to be reminded do you know what i mean there's always someone it's just it's just life you always has that ever be, been you no no always no, I'm a nightmare committed yeah i'm like that in life though so it's, it's different <laughs> but you the thing is right you what this is i mean moving on slightly you're a kind of um a sort of super freak of, of humanity because I imagine that every footballer in a, in a complimentary way, but every footballer who's played in the Premier League as a person, you know, and this is, we are talking before about how fans criticise players without really understanding the work that goes into it. For to have even played there, the amount of work and commitment that all of those players, including you, will have had to put in, that puts you in like, in a, in a very small group of people who, who have the ability, not only genetically and physically, but also mentally, to be able to get to that point. You're a, you're a super freak, right? Do you notice that when you hang out with normal people like us? You, I tell you when you notice it, when you see like stats. Yeah. I see one the other day, I think it's 0.0012% make it. Right, yeah. And that puts you in that, yeah. that it's, category. It's crazy, like, It's right? crazy. Yeah. And, uh, How do you explain that? You don't. You, I, I got released twice. Yeah, I got released twice, and I, I um, uh, when I was playing for my Sunday league team, 
uh, or when I was playing for Bishop Stortford at, I don't know, Redbridge on a Tuesday night or, do you know what I mean, whatever. Did I ever imagine going on? But I tried. I did everything I could to try and do that. And so that's so that's still a goal in your mind at that point. You're not, not you're not thinking, okay, I've been released. Uh, you know, is this the best it will get, or are you thinking, no, I I will one day step out for an international team, or I will one day play in the top flight of football. That is my goal, and everything that I'm doing is moving towards that point. Me personally, no. Right. Okay. Me personally, I. I my second season at Bishop Stortford got a job. Um, was working um, four o'clock in the morning, driving around London, like shredding confidential paper, stuff like that. And you become non-league. I think yeah. oh, not getting training tonight. No chance, manager. Yeah, I'm I'm stuck at work. I'm not. I'm just sat at home. I just. I've been working since four in the morning and I don't want to go to training and you become that and I I, I I just I got that opportunity and when I got the opportunity because I kept scoring goals because it's something I've always done and obviously you score goals at like a lower level you get noticed and I, tr I got the chance to go to Stevenage and then when I went to Stevenage I then went it was full time and I was like no I'm going to give it a go now I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to try everything and how old were you at this point 22 23 right so really young still yeah in in scheme of things but i still uh, there uh, there was there was moments um, three years at stevenage I scored 35 first season 22 the second season and 34 the third season and you're thinking what more have i got to do to get a move and you're seeing people have like one season in the same season you're there and like they get a move and in the end, I got one to Mill. Um, so there was there was moments where you're kind of fighting demons, I suppose, in a way. Like people are saying shit. Like you're thinking to yourself, like it's just this isn't going to happen. And this is this is it. And then once you once you get to the to the next to the next level, that kind of push. I don't know. I never expected when I went to League One. I didn't think to myself, oh, I'm going to get to the Premier League. I just thought to myself, oh, I'll be good if we get promoted that's my way of getting into the next level and then then all of a sudden it just happened like I remember in the January getting a f uh, some interest from Norwich and Notts Forest at the time and I'm like just trying to force like force that move because I think oh, this is I'm not going to get any better than this I need this to happen and it didn't happen and then I didn't have that great of the end of the six months scored a few goals um, then you start getting criticised because um, people start saying he doesn't even want a beer. Oh, yeah, Do you know it's I mean? been turned. You yeah. don't play well. He doesn't want a beer. Well, no, I just I've just had a bad game. Yeah. No different to I had a bad game before. But and you start to hear it more and more and more. And then I said I'll, I'll always remember getting that phone call to say we still want you, but obviously now we've been promoted to the Premier League from Norwich, and yeah. it was like it was the only thing you could focus on. But this is where my big thing has come in football is I don't think we, we're, we're mentally good enough as people. We don't, we don't care about people enough. We just think that we're all footballers and they're just going to get on with it. They're just going to deal with it. I know there's loads going on at the minute, isn't there with the racism and uh, equality and all that, all that kind of stuff. And we're focusing a load of that. And then obviously we've got the people who are retiring from the game and they're struggling with mental health and all that kind of stuff. And, some of them have come out, you're like, God, I didn't expect him to have felt like that and and stuff like that. But my biggest my biggest change in life was when I actually went I met a guy. I, I moved to Norwich and had to find somewhere to live. So I found somewhere to live and I rented a property. Lovely city. It's nice. I lived. I lived out of it. To be fair, okay. I didn't live in it. It was too much of a fishbowl for me. So mm. I moved out. I was about half hour, forty minutes away. And the guy I, I, uh, I rented off was a guy called Ray Brown, and he was doing a, for, for a better word, brain training. It was just like a mindset, like mentality, um, course, 
and he said like I've just started this thing up do you want to come and have a go so I was like I guess if you can get a couple of the other lads to come along as well so I went in got a couple of the other lads to come along and we literally went and sat in this um this pub I think it's called the King's Head and we sat in there had a little room out the back and uh he just asked the question he goes so you get taught how to read write you get taught how to to be better at football you get taught how to he said if anyone ever taught you how to use your brain he was like what are you talking about has anyone ever taught you how to use your brain and I was like no he said what what controls everything that you do and he was like your brain and then you just kept like a vault and like we had like an hour with him and then and then I left that after I think it was about six weeks course something like that and not only changed my life football but then just life in general. Mm. Now I'm in control of my my brain. I'm in control of my mindset. I think because obviously while this course was going on, like things happened and I remember going through one on one against Chelsea, against Peter Cech, and then I was clear, I was like three or four yards ahead of I think it was Terry chasing me at the time. And he tackled me. And then I was just like after I was like, how have I let him tackle me there? I just gotta put that away. And it was only after when I was doing all this, when I thought about it, I was thinking about him mm. more than I was scoring the goal. So I basically subconsciously let him get to me without him even knowing it. I've slowed down. I've taken another touch. Whereas if I was in complete control of what I was doing, mm. I'd have just gone and, gone and finished it. And once I started to learn how to con control all that and realise that I am in control of all that. It took me on like that season. I've never played better football than I did that season. I was, I, was, I, I think, I, I know I only scored like 11 goals. My first ever league season in the Premier League, we stayed up comfortably yeah. to score double figures. was yeah. big deal. A big deal. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing. What, what's the hardest thing mentally for a footballer? Is it, What's going through your mind in game situations? Is it the fans shouting at you critically during a game? Is it the stuff that the media puts out? Is it the manager putting pressure on you? Because there's an awful lot of different pressures that are mental pressures being exerted on. I mean, anybody who's famous has, there's a degree of pressure from that too. But, you know, it seems like, particularly on social media and, and in the press, there's a very quick and constant criticism or propensity to be critical and you know I can just imagine being a footballer particularly a young one who's had a bad game or missed a goal or, or whatever it is and, and that's without even talking about things like like racism or whatever yeah. I don't know how you deal with that I mean <laughs> it's football and we're, we're talking about football so we won't worry about the other side of life but football is tougher mentally than it is physically. Physically, we can all run. Don't get me wrong, injuries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, happen. I think I read, I read something the other day, actually. It's like we're a thousand times more likely to get injured than a normal person. Yeah, so like, like the risk is ridiculously high mm. I said like sometimes the little knocks and niggles you get are just ridiculous it's like just sitting there on a sofa mm. and you've put yourself in a weird position and you're just you're really comfy yeah. and then you get up and you're like yeah. what's happened to me I, I get that too that's, <laughs> that's just being old it's sed you know, sedentary lifestyle yeah, yeah. but you know when you're just you're so in, you're so finely tuned that mm. way something moves out of out of out of sync it's mm. not it can have an adverse effect but it is mentally much more tough mentally than it is physically. It is, it's, it's constant rejection. Football is about being rejected constantly. It's like acting, I suppose, in that way, going for auditions constantly, you know, every weekend and being yeah. told no all the time. Do you feel a similar way from the fans? Ex except your coach? auditions are like all on YouTube or publicly <laughs> yeah. consumable. So you're... By thousands of people every yeah. weekend, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just a constant form of rejection. So... For example, a normal week, you, so we train every, we, we train when we train every day um, and every day you're winning and losing. 
So you're, you're playing whether it's a small sided game or whether it's a keep ball or whatever it is you're winning and losing. Every Friday, you either get selected or not selected. So you get selected, you you're good. You don't get selected. You got to deal with that mentally. How do you deal with that mentally? Um, you get selected. You go out on the football pitch. You try and do the best you can do. Uh, sometimes it's not good enough. So you get negative response. Um, so it's not overly a lot of positive actions come from playing football. You just go out there. Obviously, you can you win a game. Everything's positive. You don't you don't often hear much positivity, do you? It's not normally like a negative. And obviously, social media is great for what it's done to the world and the platforms it's given it given yeah. people. But as you guys said about the younger generation who are now governed really by social media, that that is that's their their platform like they don't even send text messages anymore do they it's kind of like through a social media and you're just like well you, you have got their phone number you can yeah. just send them a message you don't have to go via yeah. twitter or via instagram or via snapchat as a senior player in the squad now which you are both by terms of of age but also experience mm. are you asked to take younger players under your wing and talk to them about some of this stuff or do you feel that it's almost incumbent upon you to, you know, if there's a lad who you can see who's maybe very talented but isn't dealing with the, the I don't know, criticism that they're getting or they're spending too much time playing FIFA yeah. or whatever, do you, do you put an arm around the shoulder and say, listen, this is what you need to do? Or is it, you know, that's a fellow professional, it's not my job, there's somebody else whose job it is to do that, so I'm going to leave it to them? No, you totally, you totally try, you see it you see it and you hear it and you, you watch in, in the dressing room and, and you, you, I've had it a couple of times this year already where you're just chatting to people and it might not even be um, anything to do with social media. It could just be like you hear them talking about like girls or whatever and situations and you just go like, have I really just heard that right? And then you make them tell you what it is and then you kind of give them a bit of advice and then you go like, do you know what I mean? Like think about what you're doing or et cetera, et cetera. You just do, it's just become like a bit of a, kind of like a dad to them do you know what I mean like and they will ask and then because you want them ultimately I want them to be able to say tomorrow this is happened what should I do rather than it be too late because I can guarantee you whatever it is that they're talking about I've either seen or been a part of or do you know what I mean so you want mm. you want it to be that sudden like from a manager's point of view they've got enough going on mm. they don't need uh, like from a senior player I'll only ever take something to them if it's something I can't deal with and I really need them to have a look at but I think that's the the biggest thing with with the, the younger players and the social media side of it is they get even more like when I first come through there was no social media so you had a bad game you might get some woman or man in the crowd shout saying it yeah but as soon as you leave that's it it's kind of it's done isn't it you go home and you don't hear about it again but Fortunately, these lads, when they when they finish a game, there you see it far too often as well. The response from the social side of it is how they govern whether they've done well or bad. Yeah, because presumably they get a little high if they've done well, so they'll be retweeting, their... retweeting, and right. you put the thing yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Don't ever see them retweeting yeah. when we've lost the game. Do you know what I mean? But they don't. It, it's. But that plays into your the idea. I mean, I've never heard a footballer talk about football as rejection every day before. That's a fascinating idea. But the social media thing plays straight into that as well because even forgetting about football, I think that is how many young people who've grown up with social media, and I, I'm just on the cusp of it. I think you're maybe a little... Did you have, did you have computers at school when you went to school? <laughs> no, not sure. No, um, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I think I'm just on the cusp of it uh, and I feel lucky to have... Uh, avoided avoided that because I feel like the idea of putting yourself out there and either being accepted or rejected is one of the main functions of social media for young people and whether it's taking a selfie and putting that on there whether it is tweeting about something you've done and you want people to congratulate you or that sort of thing the idea of, of that I mean obviously it is significantly um, 
it's under a microscope when it comes to to football because there are thousands of people yeah. following you and that you know there the pressures are intense but you see that relayed in within wider society as well i wonder because you are aware of the psychological aspect of football because you know you did the course and you have an interest in this does it help you to be aware that football is rejection every day does it help you to try and write your thinking around it or, 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 you know, do self-help or whatever to make yourself feel better? Or is it in some ways, is it kind of a curse that you are aware of it because you think about it more often maybe? I think I look at it from the point of view is that because I'm aware of it, I can be in control of it. I can be in control of, I don't do social media. I haven't, yeah. I don't, I don't go on there and like, basically if I go in on there, I'm going on there to look for negative stuff. I'm not going to look for good stuff mm. because the negative stuff jumps out at you and the good stuff just yeah. bypasses you, doesn't it? That's what I do on TIFO video comment sections sometimes. I'll find myself scrolling over loads of people who've said lovely things and then I'll stop on one that's... Uh, yeah, you're like, why have I upset him? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. And it's it's um, it's being in control. That's why I, 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 I learning and being in control of it, it makes you, makes you remember that regardless of what you do, you're just a person. We're just people. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Like football has become more, it's become less about just, you know, that, that kind of harsh world where it's like sink or swim. It's like you either make it or you're not going to make it. It's, do you know what, run. If you don't run, you're not good enough. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I'm going to scream and shout at you when you, when you don't do well those days are gone because a manager can scream and shout at you and a player can leave, open his phone and someone said something really good about him. And that's what he will listen to more than, because it might be 10 people, ah, oh, it wasn't your fault today, you you scored. And it, so I, I think it just shows to you now that it's all about people. It's all about people. It's all about not people pleasing, but people um, remember that everyone's everyone's different. Like what makes people tick? What um, what makes people what makes people happy? Um, what makes people sad? Because they're so fragile now. What did you mean before when you said that footballers not kind enough? Like to each other. I think we were talking earlier about the psychological aspect of it, and you said that that footballers aren't they don't care enough. I think about uh, each other. Yeah, not, not care about each other and, and it, everyone's consumed. You go into a dressing room nowadays, everyone's just sitting there looking at their phone. Mm. There's not like, it's not... It's a less of a sense of unity because of yeah, it. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a, a group anymore. It's not, um, you're trying to put, the best teams are having the best, the best groups of people and obviously success helps that, don't get me wrong. Mm. But that social side of... of um, Football, from when I first come into football, has gone in terms of like you'd go and get together, you get groups of people, you go and do activities and stuff like that. It doesn't happen as much anymore because everyone's consumed by their own little world and their own little social life they've got going on with their phones or, and whatever. And also presumably because some of these players have got massive followings because of that, there are additional commercial endorsements, and you know, footballers. Some footballers are are effectively brands now. Yeah, and, and football is how they came to prominence. Yeah, but actually, a lot of the revenue. I mean, it's like the um, was it the Dybala transfer to Spurs that was didn't work out because of his image rights. Mm. I mean, that's and that in itself is just of United as well. I think. Yeah, uh, you know, the idea that that actually, if you're if you're a footballer. You come to prominence because you're on the pitch and you're scoring goals or you're defending well or whatever it is. Yeah. But, but actually, what's that? What that is leading to isn't necessarily a transfer to another team. It's a it's a, an endorsement with a jeans company or a, a football trainer or whatever it is. That that that's where the focus is. Yeah, and a bigger social profile, isn't it? Yeah, you look at it and it's like if you go on, you go on everyone's Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is. It's only positive, isn't it? So it's always positive promotion, isn't it? It's always, which is great, but then everyone wants to, that's why I struggle with it. Yeah. I'm like, you can't be, 
good, 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 good. And then when someone's just like bad, go, oh, that's just like bad about me. Well, also, it's not, it's not real, is it? That's the other thing. I mean, you know, it's some not a real geezer, reflection it's, it's of some a person. Some geezer or woman or whatever, mm. just with a phone and has just gone and said something. Mm. And maybe ultimately, they're sounding off because they've had a crap day. Yeah, but ul- you know, ultimately, if, 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 you, if you played, I don't know, if you played, I played football and had a really bad game and Alex Ferguson was watching the game and he sent a tweet out saying, Joe, you know what, Steve Morrison, you wasn't very good today. I'd take that on the chin and go, be fair, Alex Ferguson said I weren't very good. When you've got people who have effectively never sure. played the game or never never done a coaching badge or whatever it is, you know what I mean? I've never had anything other than just gone to games of football and watched it. You haven't really got a um a base to be able to say the things you're saying. Mm-hmm. You're just venting. You're just you're just angry because we've lost the game. I think, well I'm I'm angry as well, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like Yeah. But they've got the platform now to be able to say something. But it's it's, it's realizing that it's realizing that. So I said the mental side of it. You need to make sure these these people, these kids who are coming through, mm-hmm. and these young lads that are now being thrust into a cruel world in terms of like a lot more negativity comes than positivity because you only really get positive stuff if if you're winning and you're not guaranteed to be winning all the time. Um, and as I said to you before, the ins and outs of the team and stuff like that is like, it's a negative. Like if you're in the team, it's it's positive. If you're out of the team, it's negative. Or you might be in a team for ten games and then get left out, and you're like, how do I deal with that? Yeah, because I don't know how to deal with it because I've never been in that situation because I've always played. So they need to learn how to protect themselves as well as well as being protected by the clubs, presumably. Which it sounds like the the course that you did with with Ray was. Part of right? yeah, it just you, you get in control of like I've I used to quite be if I didn't get picked, that'd be like, Why? Mm. Why have you not picked me? Mm. Um, I should be playing. Um, and then I learned that it doesn't change anything whether I go and ask that question or don't go and ask that question. Yeah, maybe you need to think about no, there's no problem with going in and speaking to the manager, but ask the right question. Is there anything I can do to get in the team? Well, it's also like that, that fascinating thing you said quite early on in the conversation about, about the disparity between what you've been told to do and how people perceive your performance not knowing what you've been told to do. Yeah. And I can imagine that, that, that there, is a, there can be a huge frustration because you're thinking, okay, well, you know, I've been, I've been asked to do th- a thing. I've done it. Now everyone's shouting at me. Now I've got dropped. Like what, you know, it leaves you feeling, I can imagine, extremely helpless yeah, and powerless because everything's coming in, but you've just, you've done your job and it's not worked. It's not yeah, your fault. Like, don't get me wrong. You can still be asked to do a job and not do it well. Do you know what I mean? You can yeah. still, I've asked to do that. And like, like you said, have you ever gone rogue? Well, yeah. you go rogue, you don't play. Do you know what I mean? So you're not carrying out the job that's, being asked um, and don't get me wrong you do have freedom on a football pitch I mean you're asked to do certain things and then when you get into say the final third or something like that it'll be like do you, know, you can have a little bit more freedom there do you know what I mean you can play like don't force it like if you need to come back out and do something or if doing a because you might have games where you've got a team do you know what they really can't deal with crosses in the box so this game we're going to get in those areas and, and we're going to cross it and then you're coming at half time and the manager will go like Lads, we spoke before the game. They're not very good at crosses. Stop turning down crossing opportunities. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So you might see second half, there's a lot more balls coming in the box because it's something that's been noticed by the people who are watching, yeah. as in like the staff and how to, we need to do that more. Yeah. Um, that's why you often see games where, you know, like a team hasn't done that great first half and then come out and they're like, oh, they've come out the traps firing. Blazing, no, no. Yeah. They've just been... They've been, been reminded. Couple, they've what been they, reminded. Yeah. There's been a couple of tweaks. This is what we need to do. This is where we need to go. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, we lost our way a little bit." And now it's like, bang, bang, bang. And now they're at it and they're doing it. Um, can Can I ask? You, you mentioned before about um, players reaching the end of their career, which presumably yeah. you're doing now. And particularly with regard to the mental health aspect of it, is something that we see quite a lot with footballers who retire. 
not necessarily without a plan of what they're going to do, but if they leave football, for example, that that is something that is very challenging for, for people to do because it's something that they've been doing for, you know, the last 25 years. It's yeah. all they've ever known. Um, and you've, you know, you said that you've noticed players or you've thought you didn't expect someone to feel this way or act this way once they'd left the game. Do you mind me asking how you feel about coming towards the end of your career? Because I know you've done your, co- or you're doing your coaching badges as well. Yeah. But presumably this might be the biggest change whether in in your life of the last 10 years like the most significant change in terms of going from this routine to something different how how do you feel about it um i don't feel i don't feel like i'm ready to to go and sit at home and not do anything i feel like i want to I, I, I do you know what I, i've i've ended up getting a um a desire to do more, mm. to start. Like I don't feel like I'm winding down now. You know, like, you, like your career like starts winding down and you start thinking, so I'm coming to the end now. I feel like, yeah, maybe my playing days are coming more to the end in terms of um, like my role in the team and um, maybe won't start as many games and I'm not going to have like a 50 game season of starting games. I understand that. Um, but I feel like I'm just starting as well. Like in terms of like, I have literally since I joined Millwall um, from Leeds, I, I, first thing I did was, and they were brilliant, Millwall, like Neil Harris and uh, the chairman, John, were like fantastic there in helping me. I did my B licence straight away, did that in the year, then my A straight, and then it was like, do you want to do your pro license? And it was like, I'm not going to get asked to do my pro license because you have to be invited to do that. I then got asked to do that straight away and I just, last four and a half years, just completed it all. Um, so I'm ready. And then it was like, as I'm going along, I'm getting more and more excited about it and you're kind of enjoying it more and more. And it made me a better player the last three or four years because all of a sudden I started understanding the tactical side of the game. That's interesting. Even more. I was still good at the tactical. I could carry out instructions, but all of a sudden I could I could see things from a slightly different angle. I could see things from the coaching point of view, like why they made certain decisions that yeah. before I'd be like, why has he done that? Now it's like a player would say to me, why has he done that? And I'd be able to give them an answer of, yeah, but to be fair, you've got to think about this. Mm. And that would be without even speaking to anyone. I just could understand that a bit more now. And it just made me a completely different... Um, I had to change my game anyway from like a complete runner to being a bit more of a target man, etc. But then I, I, I ended up learning the tactical side more that if I got told to carry out an instruction, I was even better at carrying that, at that instruction because I understood it from both sides. I understood why I was doing it rather than just doing it. I now understood why I was doing it and maybe I could even add something to that through something that I've picked up along the way as long as it was within the parameters that I needed to to do Mm. um but yeah now I just feel like I just got this like excitement about where you can where you can go next and and what you can do and um if it stopped tomorrow I feel like I'd be ready to to take on a challenge and go to to another challenge and Mm. um obviously like with everything you have to wait and see what those what those opportunities open up and arise but um, no, I just think I, just, I, I feel more excited than, than so worried about it. It's almost like a little perception switch, isn't it? Because as you said, you could be feeling like you're winding down, but actually you look at it in a slightly different way and you're winding up to something new. It's, it's yeah. very odd because, I mean, pretty much any other career, actually your, your 30s heading into your 40s is when you're starting to really feel secure and get proper promotions and bed into whatever your industry is and everything. And actually as a footballer, if you even make it to your mid thirties, you're exceptional as a player. So it's, it's incredibly skewed to how pretty much everyone else is. I think football is the only, the only job, or obviously other sports jobs as well, where the older you get, the value, your value gets less. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, if you went and started in a company at eighteen, the time you're thirty six, if you haven't got, if your value wasn't ridiculously high, yeah, 
then you've obviously been doing something not that, or you've at, or you've settled for your level at whatever company it is. Whereas football, once you once you peak in your late twenties, it's over. It starts to <laughs> unless you're like on, on like Ronaldo's and Messi's yeah. levels, James Milner, yeah, James yeah. Milner, Zlatan, people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you start, you just start decreasing, don't you? Like straight away, and as yeah. I said, like that's like now whatever you do you become a trainee again don't you yeah you become at the bottom of if i went and joined the company now working in recruitment or something like that in london i'm going to be making teas for someone mm. and i'm not going to be learning it and i think that's what you've that's what you have to do now you have to it's kind of exciting though as well in, in a way yeah. depending on how you look at it that's a kind of exciting thing too i think we've probably only got time for for one more question but as it relates to your, to your interest in, in, in sports psychology, I know we've talked about this a little bit already, mm. and obviously your presumably your future plans of yeah. potentially moving into coaching in one form or another. How do you see yourself applying those sorts of ideas that we've been talking about to a club? Obviously, you know where you think the deficit is from teams that you've worked in before, or mm. you know where you perceive maybe problems to be or areas to be improved. How would you apply what you have learned to a young team that's under your under your wing um i think obviously it's a difficult it's a difficult situation in terms of you don't know where you're going to be and what resources you've got etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think the the uh, i think england have started doing it with ian mitchell with bringing like a sports psychologist on board someone to not just look at the players but look at what um i mean wales used him previously and he come on one of the courses. He look he even looks at the the uh, reaction that you're going to get from a training session. So the psych the psychology behind the training session. So is that training session at the end of it going to leave a positive mark or a negative mark, for example? So you're kind of you're helping the players' mindsets without them even knowing it. But then I presume he's there for people to to be able to speak to. And I, I, I just think that I think we don't we train everything else. We teach we teach from six years old or whatever it is at football or and at school, we teach all the way how to do stuff. I just think we miss a trick if we don't help these people with their with their mental side. And it's not it's always too late. That's yeah. what I always find. I think it's always yeah. too late. We always deal with the problem yeah. once. <laughs> once it's, it's a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah. So why? Yeah. I know there's. Um, I know there's a. Uh, I think I read. I read somewhere that there is a, a funding for. I think the the um, the triple, P or whatever it is, the uh, E triple P, with the academies. Like to get funding, they have to do so much, ment uh, psychology work. Yeah. But I've I've never haven't looked into it further, but I can near enough guarantee it, I bet it's minimal. Yeah, yeah. What they have to actually do to, to get, yeah. It's a bit of a quoted thing. It's maybe. like of like you you've got to do this, okay, we do it, tick the box. We've had a meeting once. But I just I think for me for me, I think if we can if we can help people ultimately yeah. um be better people, um that can only mean that you're going to get better response and mm. better, better um, adults. Yeah, whether it's male or female, it's a case of. Is there a stigma as well? I mean, because you you know you you there's a there's a um, there's an association with football and with sports and with men particularly, right? That it's you know you're supposed to get on with it, get on with it, stand up straight, everything's fine. You know, don't worry about problems. Is, do you think one of the issues or one of the problems you might face in trying to do this in the sport as well is, is coming up against that stigma, making it okay for yeah. the players yeah, to, to accept that, that if they want to go and talk to a psychologist who's who's available? And I speak as someone who I've gone to therapy for five years. I talk to all my friends about it. And it is still a thing that sometimes when I talk to men about, they kind of, you know, they, they, they shrink back a little bit. But do you think that trying to open up that door and... and tell particularly the young players who've come you know come through teenage years of playing football with the lads and all the rest of it that mm. that is a good thing to do is absolutely fine and the earlier the better maybe yeah I, th I think i think it's um when you're that young 
if, if you can start it in academy level for example they'll do anything at that level right. they'll do anything and they just do you know what I mean but if it becomes the norm mm -hmm. and things like that we invest so much money in this sport so much money why can't we invest in that like my little lad he's eight years old he trains three nights a week he plays on a Sunday like he plays on Saturday morning trains on Saturday morning trains two nights a week plays on a on a Sunday. I ask him every day, how'd you get on? Yeah, good. That's all he ever says to me. Is it, and, and then he'll go to bed and he'll tell his mum in secret something else. Already at eight years old, he's, there's a mentality side of, of it that affects him. Yeah. Whether it's like, I don't think I did that well today or coach didn't tell me I did do you know what I mean like so already at eight years old it's starting yeah, yeah. at eight years old and that's common you know you see, see that yeah, you see it all right? the time and it, like they're even more open to learning and listening mm. than than what we are as adults because we think we, we we know it I suppose we've got all the answers and lads who come through at 20, 21 I'll have cracked it and all that kind of stuff mm. but I just I just think that obviously it's it's maybe it would be difficult in a in a football sense at, at a senior level to kind of bring it in like a whirlwind and say like look this is what you're going to do you all have to go and speak to someone but what I do notice in football that if you get one or two to do it yeah. and they start giving a little bit of a positive message across to someone else like oh, I was talking to him the other day it was really good it kind of it can it can evolve a little bit. I, you know, don't, well, I'm not sitting here thinking I'm going to change the world and I want to go in and... You know, everyone, well do. Yeah, but every, everyone in the team's got to go and see this person. Oh, why did your team do well? It did well because we all see a psychologist like once a week and stuff do, like that. Like, I do remember reading, I can't remember who had written it, but it was the idea that professional athletes basically will do anything to win. Yeah. And therefore, if you get somebody who uses a sports psychologist and their performance improves and they attribute it to that, other people may well think, well, sod it, it's worked for him, I'll give it a go. Mm. Yeah. On that basis. Yeah. And maybe uh, I'm not, I'm maybe not... that's the way it, it'll creep in. Yeah, I'm sure, I said, like, Pep Guardiola at Man City seems to be able to create, like, an environment, but he's got the tools to yeah. be able to create that environment. He can bring... And ultimately, they're winning every week. The best teams are the ones who... They win all the time because they're used to mm. to winning. It's kind of like a habit. It's a culture, and it kind of that kind of. But then you look at the teams that are always kind of struggling. It's always it's a high turnover of players. It's uh, um, new managers constantly. The best teams are the teams who have the least amount of change. Mm. Continuity. It's like what you're saying about being a footballer yourself. It's about everything being regular, everything being organised and orderly. The less disruption, the less transition, the easier it is for you. Yeah, hundred percent. And that, that makes sense at a team level as well as a personal level. Yeah, and I just think, like I said, we, I'm not trying to change the world, but I just think that more can be done because everything we always do is after the event. Mm. Oh, he's been struggling with mental health. Well, he's obviously not spoken to anyone. He doesn't feel like he can speak to anyone. Um, he hasn't tried to to make himself better. And you see, like those players that have come out since and said, oh, I felt like depressed. It's normally in the time where their team was doing bad or like, I think it was John O'Shea come out. I think he was one, I think. Um, better check that. And uh, when he was in United's team and they were winning constantly uh, and then he was having a bad time at Sunderland, I bet it was mm. performance related, team related. Do you know what I mean? Stuff environment like that. Environment as well. Environment. Yeah, yeah. Safe yes, environment. A safe environment's a, a good environment, isn't it? Rather mm. than a mm -hmm. than a negative one. Yeah. Well, the drills are starting next door, so that <laughs> seems like it's time for us to wrap up. Stop. Um, Steve, thanks so much for no coming worries. in. I found that thoroughly fascinating. Really appreciate it. Um, and you're speaking to Phil Hay at the Athletic as well, aren't you? For for a written, uh, written yeah, piece. Yeah. Right? Uh, so look out for that too. Um, thanks, and we will be back next week. <laughs>